Hello everyone, I'm Graham Trudgill, the Executive Director at Beaver, and welcome to this year's Motor Session. The hot topic chosen by our motor panel this year is behaviour-based motor insurance, the new growth opportunity for brokers. And it's my pleasure to introduce the chair for today, Richard Westcott. Richard has been a reporter, producer and presenter at the BBC since the mid-1990s and took over as a transport correspondent last year. It's been a busy old year too. Richard was the first journalist to break the news of the collapse of the West Coast Mainline Rail franchise. He was the first journalist on board the Boeing Dreamliner when it came to the UK and the first back on it after it caught fire in Boston. He's covered the explosion in whiplash claims across the insurance industry and the impact that this is having on premiums. You will also see every few months he stands outside another petrol station reporting on yet another record rise in fuel prices. Presently, um, recently rather, Richard made a short documentary <coughs> film for the BBC's Inside Out programme about the phenomenon known as peak car. It's the theory that the car use has peaked across many Western countries, something that started before the economic meltdown. The research shows that one of the biggest groups that stopped driving in the UK is young men, and doubtless the cost of insuring a car is a major factor in that decline. So it begs the question, will telematics encourage more young men back onto the roads? Richard's had two car crashes. The first 13 days after he passed his test, and the second last year reversing in fog. He drives the bottom of the range Ford Focus estate because his wife doesn't think that a white Series 1 Lotus Esprit Turbo is a practical family car. <laughs> so th please give a warm welcome to Richard Westcott. Thank you. Thanks very much. I will get that Lotus one day. Um, welcome to all of you to, to what we think is going to be a, a fascinating discussion about telematics because as a journalist it's something I'm progressively more interested in because of the impact that it could have on, on your industry and on ordinary people's lives and that's always something that affects the media a lot. So will young men suddenly start driving more safely because of telematics? Could it have an impact on fraud for example if you can have a register of how fast you were going and how fast the other guy was going does this mean that it's harder to lie to cheat the system? And we were having a discussion just in the last 20 minutes some of the uh, other applications of that data as well, it could affect road safety. You could start to identify junctions that uh, could be, uh, that are potentially dangerous because everyone keeps braking there and actually prevent accidents in the future. It's all things that we're, we're going to bring out. But there are other questions as well, aren't there? How good is the kit? How expensive is the kit? What should you use, an app or a black box? How are you going to use that data? All of that data, how do you keep it safe for people? How do you convince people to have Big Brother in the car? And who's going to make the money out of it? Is it going to be you guys or is it going to be the car makers who are going to muscle in and put black boxes in their car and go into the insurance business or rather more? And for my job I drive up and down the UK a lot and I, I talk to people all the time and it's not just the four or five minutes that you, you see on telly, it's the 20 minutes an hour while I'm gassing, gossiping, while the cameraman's doing all the work, setting everything up. And I talk to a lot of young people, and insurance and petrol are especially huge issues for them. I interviewed a guy called Lee Vernon a few months ago now. He's 19 years old, a very, very brave guy. Not only had he gone out and bought a Robin Reliant, but he wanted to drive it around Mansfield as well. So he spent £750 on this car. He then got his insurance quotes, doing it the wrong way around. The cheapest was £2,500, so he is now having to sell that car. So there is a Reliant going in Mansfield, if anyone is interested. But it's changing lives. He didn't want that car to sort of drive around town and show his mates. He actually wanted it to get a better job because there are a lot of bus cuts going on at the moment. Public transport outside of London isn't great. It's affecting people's lives. And telematics really potentially could have an impact on that. So we've got four experts here who can give us proper insight into all elements of the business, into the equipment, into the data, into how it affects driving behaviour as well, and then potentially how you, how you sell it, how you can make money out of it. Uh, and we're going to start off, each person's going to just do uh, three minutes about what they do, and then after that we'll get the questions going. And I really hope that you ask questions as well, because there are so many elements to this, I think. It's, it's really unexplored territory at the moment. So let's start with Paul Stacey, and I've got Paul's, uh, Paul's biog here. Uh, Paul's from Winelli, who basically are pioneering in, in app technology and telematics technology, and he's got some news as well for you in a, in a couple of minutes. Paul founded Winelli in 2008, 
uh, with the aim of understanding the data and technology and making usage-based insurance work for both individuals and insurance companies. Winelli is a solutions provider offering software and data analysis services. It's been a trusted provider of UK driving data to a number of insurers and brokers. And Paul says he's hugely proud of, of what Winelli has achieved. They created Coverbox, which they grew and sold in 2011. They started CompareTheBox.com, the first online telematics aggregator. And they were first to launch smartphone apps DriveStar and Drive Like Who. And Winelli is also contributing significantly to the Polaris telematics standards, uh, which will contribute to the lowering of cost of entry and speeding the time to market for insurers. And prior to Winelli, Paul studied engineering and then completed his Masters of Mathematics in queuing theory and statistics. And Winelli, if you were interested, I asked him yesterday, is an Aboriginal word meaning big things. And it's, it's the name of his dad's property in Australia, which he tells me is the size of the M25. So it's quite small. Yeah, really. <laughs> only in Australia. Anyway, Paul. Thanks, Richard. Um, I guess telematics is a hot topic. Um, I'm going to find it hard to contain myself and my enthusiasm to three minutes, but I'm desperately going to try. The current state of play is that about 1% of the market has telematics. It's mainly aimed at the high risk end of the market, i.e. young drivers. And I would say exclusively all telematics products are using an aftermarket wide black box that's put underneath the dashboard or somewhere else. I guess what we've learned from um, these types of products is that behavioral products are performing better than the traditional pay pay-as-you-drive products. So monitoring driving behaviours, we've been able to correlate that. Uh, extreme driving behaviours as well as how you drive to, to premium and claims frequencies. And it, it is working well in the young driver space. But that's, that's very niche. That's 1% of the market. That probably doesn't excite too many people in the room because traditionally brokers aren't very strong on young driver rates. We, we had to tackle the problem of the cost of delivering this type of data for these types of products. So I, I, I see where the market for usage-based insurance is moving is into lower cost ways of getting the data. Now, I think in 2020, we're talking about connected cars. Uh, cars that come off the manufacture, manufacturing lines will have some sort of telematics device in there, maybe eCall, maybe eCall Plus, but there'll be, there'll be connected cars. But there's seven years where the car park and the market needs to be served. This is where we think that we can use something that the customers have already got, and that's their smartphone. Um, there's been recent developments uh, by Google and Apple. They've released certain API libraries, uh, code that allows us to do very clever things on smartphones. And we think that smartphones will have a role in delivering data to insurers a lot more cheaply. And I think insurers are at the point now where they're actually saying, well, do we need to know every single piece of data? Do we need to know every single ignition on and off event? Can we get a DNA snapshot of how someone drives from maybe a limited sample of mileage and then keep keep monitoring them against that over time. Could customers in the future be uh, wanting to volunteer their driving DNA to insurers to get some sort of lower premium or some sort of incentive? Um, we, we think that smartphones holds the key to mass market. And today at this conference, SSP and Winelli are launching a driving app called uh, Soteria Drive. Now this app, is the first one in the UK that's being used on an ongoing basis for policy administration. It's the first usage-based insurance product that's actually using an app instead of a black box. Um, and the exciting thing for the people in this room, I guess, is that it's available through SSP systems to SSP's brokers. So small high street brokers uh, that need to have a full spectrum of products to offer their client base can now start offering telematics products as part of their offerings. So I think it's exciting, but it's, it's, it's the inevitable future. Smartphones will play an increasing role until we have connected cars.
Okay, Paul, thank you very much. And we'll be hearing a lot about apps today. Um, but let's hear from Andy next. Um, this is uh, Andy Wigmore, who I think is the only Olympian in the room. I don't know if we have any others. Um, but he's also done a lot of research into telematics and so the technology and also about how it, uh, people feel about it, how it affects driver behaviour and so on, which he, he can tell you about. Um, Andy's the Managing Director of Wigmore Media Group, which is based out of the UK and Belize. As a Belize national, he's also the ambassador for the Belize Olympic and Commonwealth Games Association, having competed in the London 2012 Games in the Olympics, uh, trap shooting discipline. Uh, he's also a director and shareholder of HCML, which is part owned by Aviva, a director of Evolution Legal, an outsourcing company to the insurance sector, as well as a director of Claims Witness Solutions, which provide technology for many of the telematic products currently on the market. And for the last 10 years, he's also been directly involved with the regulation of claims management companies, acting as the spokesman for the trade body, the Claims Standards Council, and sitting on the MOJ Regulatory Consultation Group. He's appeared on telly many times and on radio as well, commenting on ambulance chasers and rogue activities. And Andy, I, I'm not going to mention your recent ranking in the uh, trap shooting. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Well, just, for, just so you know, I'm actually last in the world, <laughs> which um, I'm actually quite proud of. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, I come to this, this sector in a particularly peculiar way. Um, as uh, Richard touched on, I was, I've been working with a lot of the regulation of claims management companies. And about five or six years ago, um, uh, the title, which most of you are probably familiar with, is Ambulance Chasers. Well, this is a particular ambulance catcher, and there is a very big difference because these organisations work quite closely with brokers and insurers already. So this filthy little secret that everyone suddenly discovered that um, actually the commercial transaction in the process was already going on right across the board was obviously taking place uh, a lot further in the past than people really realised. The reason I say that is because this particular company, um, Action 365, were quite pioneering in how they decided that they wanted to interact with the broker customer that they were dealing with, how that broker customer would then be dealt with, and particularly if it was a young driver, what they would then do. So telematics was an obvious choice for them to experiment with, and it was an experiment. And the idea that you could actually concierge a youngster between the seven ages of 17 to 20, they get this black box um, put into their vehicle, and you could monitor their behaviour, but also if they then had an adverse event, then the actual process of claims management was then looked after by this particular company. And I say that because the technology five years ago, as, as we will probably touch on all collectively, was analogue in comparison to what it is today. So what we decided to do was a lot of behavioural activity and understanding the, the way people drove, how they drove, what they liked, what they disliked, and whether, in fact, uh, the black box telematics had any commercial um, sense whatsoever. Um, and over the period of that time, we worked with a lot of technology companies. One of the things I also or work with, people I also work with, is an organisation called Genie Capital. Genie Capital owned the Formula One Lotus team. And telematics for them in a Formula One car is absolutely everything that they do. And some of the things that they have been pioneering over the last few years are pretty standard now in as far as motor manufacturers are concerned. So you're starting to see this huge convergence of telematics in motor vehicles right across the board. Or everything that they do has um, electronic data gathering. But the bit that we are most interested in today, of course, is whether or not uh, the telematics has an actual effect on behaviour. I fundamentally believe it does, and we did a survey of 250 um, drivers between the ages of 17 to 20 and asked them over a two-year period if we could monitor them to see what they did, how they did it, what they liked, what they disliked, but also then take that information and try and work out if there's a commercial model that you could apply to brokers and insurers, and whether or not it was worthwhile at all. So that's kind of where we sit or where I sit in the world. Also, just, um, just a, as a byproduct of that, in our discussions and in our research, we discovered that there is a great correlation between how whiplash could be measured and how telematics data could also be used. And of course, the debate, as a lot of you will know, um, currently going through Parliament about the whiplash culture and how that can be re-engineered, what kind of um, technologies and what kind of new techniques can be used to try and develop different ways of measuring whiplash or whiplash-associated disorder. And so we've been using all these techniques together to collectively come up with a model which we think is commercially sensible, but politically might be uh, advisable for everyone to look at differently. OK, 
Okay, Andy, thanks very much. Um, Simon next. Simon Wars up from Aviva. Now, interestingly, Aviva did go into the telematics market seven years ago mm -hmm. and then came out of it, uh, and they're now dipping their toe in again with a new app. And in, I think that shows just how quickly this technology is changing and how quickly the market is changing as well. Um, Simon graduated from the University of Sheffield with a first-class degree in mathematics in 1990. He joined Norwich Union in September 1990 as an actuarial trainee and qualified in 1996. He's a life actuary by training, but moved into general insurance in 2004 and has worked extensively in pricing and product development roles. He's currently partnerships and business development director for Aviva GI UK. He's been involved in telematics and related subjects since 2005. Outside of work, Simon's interests include reading, travel, films, and trying just about anything at least once. Uh, and he's married with two children, aged 10 and 12. So we've worked at it seven years before you get that. The, the five thing that's five so, years before, oh, yep. five yep. before you get the chill down your spine yes. with your yep. child saying, Daddy, can you teach me how to drive? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and so um, you know, I, I'm the underwriter uh, on the panel. And I think you know, the, the thing I've always struggled with is with the standard question set that we ask our, our customers, um, two 17-year-olds presenting themselves might look identical uh, in, in their rating factors, but what I can't tell from that information is um, th does one of them want to use their car simply to drive to and from college and the other one want to thrash their car around Glasgow city centre at three o'clock in the morning with eight people rammed into the car and it's a Renault Clio. Um, and, and so uh, our, our interest in this is around telematics data can certainly start to dis distinguish those two, th those two types of people. Um, so, so massive interest from an, <coughs> from an underwriting point of view. Um, you know, also, as, as a father, uh, I, I'm very interested in, in how this, um, th these products relate to young drivers because of the, of the behavioural change that uh, telematics devices can drive, um, because uh, the, 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 the ability for me to look at how my son is driving and say to him, do you, know, do you realise you're driving like an idiot and if you carry on like that, I'll take the keys away or whatever it might be. Um, so, so there's a great opportunity for a for an underwriter, uh, there's a great opportunity for, you know, for, for the public in, in, in general. And I think there's a good opportunity uh, in, in this space for brokers because there's going to be a myriad of different offerings out there and, and making sure you're picking the right uh, offering for your customer uh, will, will, be, will be very important. And I think the, the conversation about black box or smartphone or, or something else is, is really interesting. So we were in the market 2006 through 2008 with a black box based uh, product. And what we found at the time was pe people did not like um, the fact that they, they had to have a very high premium in, in order to make the, the cost of the box uh, justifiable, uh, albeit it was wrapped into the premium. Uh, they had the inconvenience of having the, the, uh, the black box uh, fitted to their vehicle. And then they had the spy in the cab, uh, which back then people were very, very uh, protect, protected about the idea of people knowing where they were driving. I think the world's probably moved on. If we, if we roll the clock forward now, um, I think you know, black boxes have come down in price and that's great. And also the premiums for younger drivers have gone up a lot. So uh, there's actually a, a greater proportion of young drivers uh, who could um, you know, bear the cost of black box in their vehicle. But the problem is that that didn't really get to the heart of um, what, what customers didn't like about black boxes. Because the thing that people didn't like about black boxes is they had to go through you know, the cost of having the, back, the black box fitted, the, um, the inconvenience of having it fitted, and then drive around with the spy in the cab for a couple of months before the underwriter could actually tell them how much their premiums were going to be. So that was the fundamental um, you know, flaw with the black boxes. So, look, look we, we've completely changed horses in terms of what we've launched into, the, into our direct market with the Aviva, uh, Aviva Drive app, which is a try-before-you-buy uh, app. You run the app for 200 miles of driving, and, and from that, before you, uh, before you get your policy, and from that, we work out how much of a discount of our standard rates we can give to you, and then um, you get the premium set for the year with that discount uh, into it. So we've, we've almost gone flip right the way to the other side. Do, do I think that's the end of the journey for Aviva? C certainly not. I think there's gonna, still gonna be a bunch of people who you'd want to make sure that you are monitoring their, uh, that they're driving throughout the, the policy year. Um, but what, we're, what we've done at the moment, we've launched into, uh, you know, into the smartphone market. And, and actually, you know, Paul very kindly um, stole half of the things I was going to say because at, at, you know, absolutely we're, we're both heading in the same direction that the apps right now are a really good place to go. 
Okay, thanks, Simon. Um, now we're uh, going to talk to Peter Shaw, Peter from Thatcham, and I'm sure we're all from very familiar with their work, but they've been doing a lot into uh, research into the standards of the kind of technology that you can all expect. So Peter joined Thatcham as chief executive in, in April 2011, bringing with him a broad background in motor insurance, motoring services, and more recently in the UK energy sector. His appointment at Thatcham followed six years at Centrica, where as operations director, he led a number of functions including sales operations, smart metering, and billing at British Gas Business. Peter's experience in motor insurance and motoring services was gained during 22 years with the Automobile Association, where he held a number of positions, including that of sales director, and also spent a period heading up the motor and home insurance claims and customer service operations. Over the past two years, Peter has led Thatcham through a strategic review, leading to a refocusing on its core vehicle research, group rating and repair sector training, and information services. Thank you, Richard. Uh, only served to remind me how old I am, actually. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, yeah, so I, I've been asked to look at this from the point of view of the vehicle manufacturer, and uh, I'm perhaps unusual in the room in that I'm not trying to make money out of telematics. Um, Thatcher are a not-for-profit organisation. We're funded by the insurers, and uh, we're here to provide a service, and uh, and that you know, uh, assisting the telematics integration into the insurance market is one of those services which we're working on. Um, so from a, a manufacturer's, a vehicle manufacturer's viewpoint, um, you know, they are these days amazingly capable uh, technology companies in their own right. And they're on a kind of journey at the moment towards fully autonomous vehicles on our roads. And, uh, you know, you're seeing elements of this, of driver intervention systems being, uh, you know, integrated already, such as autonomous emergency braking, which takes control of the car and stops you from crashing. Now, um, they're very interested in uh, telematics capability, um, and obviously they're already integrating it into their cars. And you know, the message I've got for you is that they're going to do this with us or without us as an insurance industry. And so uh, what, they are, what they ask of us at Thatcher, and we have you know, development engineers and safety engineers from vehicle manufacturers at Thatcher every week, virtually every day, and they often are at the moment asking us, you know, what do you want from us in terms of telematics capability to assist the insurance market? And they do that because they think they'll sell more cars if they can produce an offering that genuinely assists you to underwrite uh, more effectively. Um, so Thatcham's work uh, around this has been led by the ABI and its steering groups for telematics. And the ABI, I think, have done some really good work here and they've um, produced the, the good practice guide uh, for telematics already. That was um, published only a week or so ago. Uh, they've led the Polaris work um, that's already been mentioned actually uh, to do with uh, the data standards and they've also guided our work in terms of the technical standards for devices that provide telematics data to insurers. Um, we've, we're doing this work in order to define the standards in three key areas as far as the devices are concerned and that's driver behaviour data and uh, technology, the uh, claims notification aspects of it, and also the um, claims analysis, the sort of accident reconstruction capabilities that electronic data recorders can provide us. Um, and I have to say, it, most importantly, because I've heard already quite a lot about you know, apps today, and they are definitely you know, one of the, the ways forward. Um, and, and maybe we believe, you know, convergence of these technologies, whether it's app or black box and the car itself, will be what wins the day ultimately. But frankly, we are in the, tec the technical standards that are being developed. We're totally device agnostic. And so what, what we put together has to work in all of those cases and assist all of those cases. And one of the key reasons for this is the regulatory risk that we have as you know, a sort of fledgling uh, uh, capability in telematics. The, tele the, you know, the FCA are already you know, announcing they're going to be more interventionist and you know, th they know about telematics and they may well start to take an interest in it. And we have to, I think, um, display as an industry that we're operating in a manner 
that is good for the consumer and uh, appropriate for such, a, su for such an industry. Um, and also the Competitions Commission, you know, they're, they're already looking at uh, the private motor market. And, you know, would the, competi would the Competitions Commission, the regulator, be comfortable that, you know, th the portability of the data that is currently out there with telematics is appropriate for the market? Um, so to summarise and finish up very quickly, you know, the VMs are capable and they really want to play. They want to get involved and they want to assist. Um, our work is around the setting of standards, the technical standards, not the data standards, but the technical standards for the devices themselves. And um, we believe that by being proactive in this market, we can, if you like, stave off the regulatory pressure that might come by displaying appropriate um, procedures and processes are in place. Okay, Peter, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to get things going with a, a question or two, and after that, we'd really encourage you to ask questions as well, because you've got four guys who know all elements of, of, this, um, of this area. But let's talk about apps first of all, because it's the thing that we were talking about for 20 minutes beforehand, it's the thing that keeps coming up. How good can an app be? Because as a layman looking at it, I think where well, you've got something on a mobile phone, you could forget your phone, it can fall on the floor and you throw on the brakes, batteries can run out. You could give it to your mum, who's a good driver, and she could drive it around for you. How, how good can an app be and how accurate can the data be with an app? And I guess we'll start with you, Paul, because you, you've got one out today. Uh, it's not as good as a box. I'd prefer a box. Um, uh, but, but what an app, what we've learned at Winelli is that Drivers are creatures of habit. They tend to drive on similar roads at similar times. They tend to break speed limits at similar amounts. Um, and we've sort of, we, we, we've noticed that after 200, 300 miles, you can detect very familiar patterns in the way someone drives. So if an app's purpose is predominantly to select out better risks from the market, yeah, customers that are prepared to be monitored, and get a feel for how they drive, try and give some feedback on driver behaviour, I, I think it can achieve those, those, those aims, and it can achieve it a lot more cost effectively, potentially. Detailed accident reconstruction, not a chance, <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, sort of robust, automatic first notification of loss, no, no way, yeah. But I think they can be as good as a black box. The thing with an app is, you're not, a, you're not gonna get every trip, you're not gonna get every ignition on and off event. That we can do some clever stuff, like turn the app on without the customer touching the phone and turning it off, yeah? We can increase the amount of data that's recorded without blowing out people's phone plans. Um, <coughs> but fundamentally, it, you know, in the mass market, we needed to find a way to try and do 80% of the things, but for pounds, not hundreds of pounds. Andy, you've, you've done a yeah. lot of work talking to young people about this. Is well, it, 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 it is the absolute technology of the, of the age group that particularly we're, we're talking at here in America, for instance, where they have a slightly different system. They're much more further advanced in, in the use of mobile technology, and for them it is all about mobile technology. In this country, you've got um, three organisations which have been working on trying to get some um, um, more integrated um, vehicle-generated information, which is what the terminology they use. So you've got Vodafone, you've got Cisco Systems, and you've got the old Martin Dawes company, who was one of the pioneers of mobile. And if you take those organisations collectively together, what you've potentially got is um, something which could be, as far as technology is concerned, used effectively across all different types of platforms. And that's the aim, and that's what they're trying to, to do at the moment. Next month in the United States, there's a big telematics conference. We're actually going to launch what they think is certainly the ubiquitous um, technology platform which can be applied to mobile using Sprint. Sprint is a billing system which um, gathers all sorts of um, crazy data, and that data can be used very effectively in the same way they hope that telematics data can be effectively used. But mobile is it. We, as I said, looked at 250 people over a, a two-year period, and uh, they all absolutely love the, the fact that you can actually inter, in, integrate and talk with a mobile app. I think what um, uh, you've done, Paul, is brilliant, and I think that is definitely the way it's going to go, because it's accessible. 
and that's accessibility if you're trying to encourage youngsters to adopt this and change their behaviour and understand uh, driver safety, all those kind of elements that you need to do, then the only way really that you're going to be able to talk to them effectively is using the language that they understand, which is mobile. What about you, Simon? You started with black boxes, you've yep. come to apps. Yeah, yeah. look, to be absolutely clear, black, black boxes are far, far better at um, you know, get, getting you verifiable data, uh, informing you of actual events like a, a, an actual, a, yeah, a, actual accident. Um, ne nevertheless, the smartphones are giving us sufficient information to give customers meaningful discounts off of, uh, off of a normal product, uh, pr proving they could, providing they can prove they're a good driver. Um, and, and I think if, if we were in a market that was completely saturated with lots and lots of really good technology, detecting how people dro uh, drove and just trying to shave a, a percent off here and there, then smartphones wouldn't be the way to go. Then you'd have to go to for black box or some sort of fitted uh, device. But given that we're in a market that's em embryonic right now, then ha having something which just gives you a an edge over your competitors is, is sufficient to, you know, to, to give you something meaningful and, and worthwhile. So um, it, it won't be the end of the story. That there'll be other, other things coming along, for example, tethered devices with OBD, um, for, for younger drivers, uh, etc. But, but nevertheless, right, right now, it's fit for the purpose in the market we find ourselves in. And Peter, you were talking about a combination of different things. Is that, is that what you see? I mean, does that, does that, do apps have a limited shelf life until the black boxes become very cheap and easy to fit and, and easy to update? I, I honestly think time will tell. I don't know. But I, I, the one thing I'd like to add is that we're slightly behind the curve in the UK here. It, take, for, for example, the US. Um, all cars um, that are sold in the US with an electronic data recorder have to meet a certain standard for that data recorder. And 92 or 93% of cars that are sold have it. And so it was much easier in the US to you know, tether an app to that, that you know, EDR that's already fitted to a vehicle. And obviously there's benefits there of low cost. And uh, I think as Paul said, you know, I totally agree, the apps are great for the driver behaviour stuff, but they're not so good at the moment anyway for, um, you know, crash reconstruction, ethanol, and so on. Yeah, I but think. I, you see, this is interesting because I think the reason why did we, why is telematics so prevalently topical at the moment? You've got to think politically why it was talked about. Young drivers, the rising cost of motor insurance was prohibitive for you know, young um, people to actually get driving full stop. So there's a bit of a political angle here because commercially actually it makes no sense whatsoever because these, these things are prohibitively expensive at the moment and a youngster, as you've quite rightly pointed out, buys a Robin Reliant and suddenly discovers that £2,000 insurance, they're not going to drive. So part of what we discovered in the early days that the initial 250 when you break it down to male-female, the amount of men that are not driving anymore, as I think you found out in your, some of your research, is because of the economics around driving. They can't afford to drive. And um, you know, the, the political pressures that then put on government and regulators to try and find mechanisms by which you make it um, telematics or insurance for young people accessible, I think has been a big driver in a lot of this. So remembering why telematics has been introduced to the market, I think is quite important commercially then if you're trying to work out how do you make it accessible, which is where I think you know, Paul's product actually could be a, a catalyst for a lot of that. Great. Does anyone have a... Yes, go on. Peter made a very interesting point there about where the different stages with the different technology for the smartphone, for the app, for the black box. America have already felt the pain and sort of come up with a new system. Should we be trying to dictate that to the manufacturers now to adopt a, a simple, all across the board system in order that we will mm. be to max down the I, I, I'm going to jump in here because the majority of telematics in the US is progressive. Yeah? Now, Progressive have a relationship with GM. Yep. GM, they're only fitting it to four makes and models, and they've got standardised OBD port positions. Yeah. So even though the US, in terms of the number of boxes they've got out there, rivals the UK, the great big white elephant in the room is, actually, it's only on four makes and models of GM. Yeah. But Ford have just introduced their own version. Presumably, GM box orders in some similar purposes. Mm. I think, I think, yeah, the, the point is that the US have uh, defined the standards that any manufacturer must um, integrate into their product if they're going to fit an EDR. So the, the EDR is not a telematics device, but it's just the data recorder. 
um, which gives you, you know, could potentially give you all the information you want, but it won't necessarily transmit it. And, um, you know, what are the current work on telematics um, technical standards, uh, which is being led by uh, Dr. Alex uh, Edwards just behind you. Uh, what that work is, is doing at Thatcham is going to define, if you like, the minimum standards that have to be achieved, on top of which I'm sure you know, the bright people in this industry will innovate. And what, what we don't want to do is stifle innovation. And the danger is that regulation stifles innovation. So we believe that by, by giving the manufacturers the minimum technical standards that we require as soon as we possibly can, and we intend to do it this year, we'll at least get ourselves into a position where you have a platform on which you can then build. Uh, I think, I think my, my point here is, um, look, look, if every manufacturer started fitting the same device in every vehicle, it would take, what, two years to get around 15, 20% of the, of, the, of the car park, by which time, by the way, um, technology's moved on and insurers will be wanting to rate on, on, on new technology. And if you remember what, what I was saying about smartphones, that they, they work fine now because it's not a massive competitive market. But if you had devices fitted in every vehicle, then every uh, insurer would be, would be um, trying to find that new angle, that extra bit of data they could get, and therefore would want something else in, coming from the, the black box. So I, I, I'm not sure that line-fitted black box devices are, are going to be you know, the answer to all of our prayers because it, takes, it will take so long to get through the car park and because everybody will be looking to try and get an edge um, over their competitors by, by having a new bit of data. Okay, yes. Ashley West from Nitro Insurance Bureau. Can this change tax slightly? I mean, this data, it doesn't matter whether it's coming from a black box or it's coming from a smartphone, is the customer's data. And the customer's going to want to uh, present that data to a competitor at some point. They're going to want to be able to say, Here's over the driver I am, here's my data, um, give me a quote. Uh, and th they could do that obviously by um, going to a particular insurer. They could even, we could even move towards a position where you put that data on some sort of central hub and the insurers bid for it in some way. But however you do it, you've got to have that data portable. It's got to be the customers, they've got to be able to, to move it around the market. Do any of you perceive an appetite for that within the market? I can start. Um, I think that there is an appetite for that. Ultimately, that's what customers will want and that's what we'll have to deliver and rise to the challenge of providing. Um, portability of customer data and telematics is no different of portability of customer in other areas. What we've got to consider is that we've got insurers with varying degrees of knowledge. Yeah. So the market is learning. There's some insurers that have n no understanding yet. There's some insurers that are well down the line. Yeah? So if we're going to have portability of, of data, it would rely on um, some way of controlling it and uh, enabling insurers to put into aggregators or quote engines in a common standardised way when the market has such varying <coughs> degrees of knowledge. Uh, I think insure, we're going to need to spend the next couple of years uh, uh, bringing everyone's knowledge about the data up to up to speed before we can get to that ubiquitous point, I think. Um, but there's been some good work being done by Polaris around the minimum data requirements. Polaris are not trying to dictate how insurers should use it for rating. They're just saying these are the minimum data standards required. Polaris are then feeding that up to the ABI working group. The ABI will look at it and make a recommendation to insurers. There's good work being done to enable portability. It just takes time. Well, Ashton, when we looked at these 250 people, youngsters, the thing that was literally screamed out at the end of the year, have I driven well? And you, we, we allowed these people to actually monitor their driving habits and behaviours over every month so they could see spikes and you know, speed analysis and everything. At the end of that year, what they wanted was almost like an MOT certificate to say, I've, I've driven OK. Now, the simplicity of that, of any insurer saying, yeah, you've driven OK, you haven't had any adverse events, you haven't made a claim, great, almost like your own know, claims bonus. I think that kind of certificate, simplistically, would be enough to pass on to insurance that actually, if the other insurer said they're okay, fine, they haven't made any claims. The, the data is only relevant when there is an adverse event. When it, that was really when it becomes very rich and very important to use in, in relation to understanding what's happened. And so at that point, yes, 
how, how can you share that? And I think that's a debate which is ongoing. But just on its very basic commercial terms, I don't think consumers, well, from the 250 with, that we've got, are only concerned about, you know, have I driven all right? And actually, therefore, am I going to get discounts off my next policy? That, in a simplistic term, might be the answer. And just to echo you know, the, the point that Paul made, if you ask 10 insurers who are doing something in this space, what, what, what data they're using, you'll get 10 different, different answers. Some of the answers will be subtly different, some of the answers will be fun fundamentally different. Uh, you know, the idea of a minimum standard is, is great. Uh, actually, get, getting the, the, the data into the hands of the customer is, is one issue. The, the next issue is getting the receiving insurer to accept that data and, and give it you know, a, a similar value. And of course, each insurer wants to give that particular bit of data a, a different value. Um, I, th I think we've got a long way to go in this space before we you know, get, get to any sort of commonality um, of rich data. Uh, we'll get commonality of, of basic data pretty quickly. I have a quick data question for you, really. Where does it end, effectively? What do you need to prove someone's a good driver? And then what do you do beyond that? Because do you sort of get people to put in whether they're going shopping or not? That could be useful to companies who run shops, you know, do you, do you put together the information that's useful for governments and governments might pay for it? Where, do, where does the data end? That's a sort of frightening question, not, not because, um, you know, not, not in essence, but because it's so broad a question. Um, uh, you know, but when uh, most people going into telematics are, have gone in with something that's based broadly on how people accelerate, how people brake and how people corner. And uh, you know, if we manage to saturate the market with um, acceleration, braking, braking and cornering uh, products, what, what we get next is um, looking at how people overtake. Uh, what what you get after that is looking at how many people were in the vehicle, uh, the time of day they were driving, the sorts of roads they were driving on. And, and you would just keep, to innovate, uh, keep innovating and trying to keep what, one step ahead of your competitors. Uh, and so I, I think there'll, there'll be a whole uh, industry within um, underwriters of, around analyze that data and making sure you're just keep trying to keep one step ahead of the, of the other guys or leapfrogging the guy who's currently ahead. I think secondary to that will be all the other useful information that you'll get out of there and, and could you do some sort of uh, data you know, sale uh, of that data. Uh, and back in, the, in our 2006 through 2008 pilot, we, we did build a um, data sale um, department alongside the, the telematics work. And what we found as, as Aviva was we were very, very poor at selling that data because that's not our core competency. Our core competency is around underwriting. Um, I'm, I'm sure there are people out there who, you know, given that data, will be able to do a really good job of selling it to government, selling it to the shops, selling it to you know, a whole host of different people. But, but again, bearing in mind that the individual customer data is their own data, so you'd have to be selling anonymized data about how things work in general, such as you know, which, which road junctions are dangerous. I mean, Andy, were, were people nervous about giving information? Yes, um, big brother. Um, they, they, for the first three months, um, people just did not like the fact that they thought someone was looking at them and watching them at all. It's only when you started to interact that you actually got a very different sense. So what we did, um, you know, every time there was a, a speeding infringement which was excessive, and by that I mean 10% over, let's say, a particular sp um, speed limit, they got a text message or an email. Just to, and it was a, there was a part of an education process to say about road safety. Now, gradually, you started to see people respond to those, and the way that worked is if they had um, a spike in their activity, we would ask them to read a couple of questions about road safety, and they had to, we had to prove that they'd read them and respond, which allowed them to us to then take on that they had actually looked at that problem, looked at that situation. And over the period of a year, that seemed to have worked quite well, and people actually liked being educated and told about certain things and, and certain parts of what they've done wrong against also what they've done also right. You know, well done, you've done well this month, you haven't sped. I mean, I know it's a sound of a very corny way of interacting with a, an age group, but actually that interaction is quite important at that age because you can incentivize them. Points equal prizes. I and mean, if, if you drive well over a three month period, you get 10 pence off a litre of petrol, which seems to be one of the primary drivers and concerns of young motorists anyway, how much it costs to drive. So that, that, I know it's marketing, but it actually did work. And we found that there was, after a year, there was a much better response to that big brother kind of attitude than there was initially. Maybe that's some, you know, something could be expanded on, I don't know. OK, yes, thanks. Um, would the police have access to historical data and would they be able to prosecute retrospectively? If they could tap into the information <laughs> in the black box Do you want me and to they could see uh, offences being committed, <laughs> what would happen? Uh, we've, uh, 
Okay, so to be used in a court of law, the telematics device needs to be home office approved. Yeah? So uh, and none of our telematics boxes are home office approved. So the prosecution will always argue the accuracy of the GPS data. Yeah? Police often come to us um, and ask us for information, but there's a proper process that's been laid down for us to give, give over this personal data, which we're the custodians of, of our partners, uh, customers. Yeah? So the Information Commissioner's Office has laid down a process of which the police must follow. Yeah? Basically, it's, the, it's up to the customers uh, of, 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 of these products to give their consent. If they don't give that consent, then the police have to subpoena us for the data. Yeah? And that has only happened to us once. And that's when you need to give over the data. Um, so there's the so you know there's no the GPS data cannot be relied on to retrospectively write tickets out six months ago because you exceeded the speed limits, yeah? Because the boxes See, aren't. Point when if they're installed in all vehicles, the policeman would literally be able to plug in directly into the black box on the spot and read the data at that point, or would that not be possible at all? Well, the only thing I'd respond to on that um, from a vehicle manufacturer viewpoint is, you know, they'll probably be able to do that by plugging into the onboard diagnostics port of the car, whether or not they've got an insurer telematics device in the future. I mean, you know, cars already have, you know, sophisticated cars already have these and increasingly it'll be the norm. And so whilst I think that is a key driver of customer perception of telematics you know, it's, it's the big barrier, isn't it, as to why customers don't all uh, volunteer for it immediately, um, because there's a fear of that, definitely. Um, but the, the reality will be that over time, the cars have that capability to give the police that, uh, that data anyway. I was, somebody was telling me only this week that um, uh, a solicitor who happened to have bought a Porsche GT3 was doing 130 miles an hour on the weekend that he bought it. And uh, he... He was caught. He sort of tried to argue that the police had inaccurate um, data, and uh, they were able to plug into the Porsche and pull out the data that proved he had been speeding at that speed. So, um, yeah, I think it's there anyway. Yeah, I think that goes with the vehicle manufacturers. Um, from an insurance point of view, in, in the period we had um, the black boxes in vehicles 2006 through 2008, we didn't ever get subpoenas, so we didn't actually go through that process. The, f the flip side, though, is we did have one of our, um, one of, one of our insured in involved in an accident where they rear-ended an another car at a roundabout. They were travelling at three and a half miles an hour at the time they hit the other car. We had uh, five whiplash claims from the car in front, um, and we presented the, the data uh, in, in court and got thrown out. You know, the, the whiplash was paid um, in, in the, um, in, in the favour of, of, of the victims, as it were, of, of the crash. Now, I think... That, that was partly to do with attitudes at the, at the time, uh, partly to do with Home Office approval, but uh, I'd be interested to see how that would go um, if it was presented as court now. I think you know, the world has moved on, but uh, yeah, interesting anyway. We just, interestingly, we've been subpoenaed once, but we've recovered five stolen vehicles from customers that have cancelled their pol uh, policies, that have had them stolen after they let it cancel or lapse. So it's sort of, it's, it's, uh, we've had far more positive interaction by being able to turn the box on and locate it when it's stolen than we've you know, had to use it in a, after being subpoenaed. Just quickly, can we talk about whiplash before we run out of time? I mean, Peter, first of all, what, what impact could this have? We do whiplash all the time. Editors love it at the BBC. It's adding all of this money to insurance premiums and, and people are fed up with it. What difference could this make, do you think, to whiplash claims? Well, the value at stake is massive, isn't it? So, you know, depending on which figures you believe, um, two to four billion pounds worth of claims cost uh, per annum paid out on, on whiplash. And um, for sure, the data that you get from a black box of, you know, virtually any of this uh, kind uh, would give you the accelerations that were experienced in that incident and give, as, as Simon described, a very accurate representation of, you know, the severity of the crash. Um, you know, the problem at the moment is that our legal system re relies upon, you know, the medics to say, 
whether Whiplash was there or was not there. And um, at the moment, without this telematics data, they're not, you know, the doctors believe, as everybody knows in this room, the doc doctors believe their patient. They, they kind of have to. And that's what leads to these yeah. claims being thrown out. But I think with the advent um, of, of the Jackson reforms, um, you know, that have just been launched in the UK, and with the potential for change in the future, where they're talking about setting up these medical panels to review the whiplash claims uh, in some detail, if that happens, then I think those medical panels will be hungry for data such as this to help inform you know, their decision making. So I think there's potential in the future for some you know, significant change and improvement in that position. I think we've got time to squeeze in one more quick question. Uh, yes. Well, we have. We thought a lot about it when we got subpoenaed. That's certainly true. I, I would like to think that by giving uh, feedback to drivers, uh, we're changing behaviours and making the, the, the road safer. Um, we're able to provide that feedback and get more than the driver involved in the discussion. I think a lot of nine, I think a lot of 19-year-old males will go. Actually, I don't want to be monitored, but I've actually got no choice. The five top quotes that I can afford are all telematics at the moment. Um, on Go Compare, um, I think that the stark reality is that with the very high-risk drivers that the market is pushing younger drivers to have telematics. That's a trend that will continue. Um, so I don't think it's going to be a choice for young people to necessarily opt out of telematics. I think in two years' time they will need a box. I don't um, think they'll have a problem with it, actually. I, I get the feeling from the, the survey we've did. I think after a while they get used to it. It'd no, be just part of the norm. They right? get used to it very quickly. And of course, a 19-year-old male doesn't think he's going to have a, quite a, quite a crash at inception. Yeah. He thinks about the price and whether he can afford that car. But, but, but it's, it's certainly a risk that the insurer um, runs of being associated with the subpoena and they had to give over the data uh, that, that got the conviction, and, uh, I understand that. And I think that's a risk that most insurers going into this market will, will be prepared to take. And I think it's a risk that the, that the driver, you know, the, the insured person has to take as well. And I think most people will, will economically be forced to take that risk. Uh, but, but then recognising that actually for, for the insured population who have a black box, the risk is actually lower because their driving behaviour is different to the average insured population. But, but the risk is, is definitely there. Okay, yeah, just quickly. Just quickly, yeah, I, I think it's a fair question, but I think you could also turn it on its head and say, you know, that actually the, most people are law-abiding and, you know, drive sensibly. And in fact, if that's the case, and that's the vast majority of people, then they're protected by the data that's in mm -hmm. the black box because if they're accused of driving, you know, irrationally or dangerously, they can potentially prove that they weren't by providing the data. So I think there is two sides to that argument. Okay, frustratingly, I think we've, we've actually run out of time. As I think we had a lot more ground to cover, didn't we? But it's, it's an amazing issue, I think. It's certainly an issue that journalists are getting more and more interested in. And if it does start bringing premiums down, we'll be doing lots of pieces about, probably out with the Lee Vernons of this world, about how he can drive and how he can afford to, is Robin Reliant and so on. So thank you all very much for coming and thank you for your questions. Thanks very much for Paul Stacey at Winelli, for Andy Wigmore, Wigmore Media Group, and Simon Warsup from Aviva and Peter Shaw from Thatcham. And thanks for Graham as well from Bieber for organising this seminar and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks very much. Thank you.